Hello, I'm Eric Topol, Editor-in-Chief of Medscape, and we're having a one-on-one -on -one with Professor Stephen Quake, uh, who's a friend of mine over many years, has been lightening it up in the fields of biology, where physics and math and biology all come together for many years, heads up the Chan Zuckerberg Biohub, uh, and we've got a lot to talk about today. Welcome, Steve. Thanks, Eric. It's great to be here. Well, I thought I would start out because you've had a unique career path. Um, people talk about transdisciplinary teams, and I think about it, that being all in your head, and that is your background, where you've been involved in kind of single molecules and microfluidics from the beginning. So can you give us a bit about where, how you got into that? Sure. Um, so I trained as a physicist and uh, was interested in the interface between physics and biology. It seemed to me that biology was expanding in all directions. Physics had become fairly mature and you know, some uh, connection between the two seemed like where I wanted to make my career. And uh, I was very influenced by my freshman physics professor, Steve Chu, um, who uh, did many, many great things in science, but uh, uh, one of which was to help invent optical tweezers and use them to pull on molecules. And he roped me into helping do that as part of my undergraduate research thesis and became a mentor. And that led me into experimental biophysics and single molecule biophysics, where I worked for a number of years. And then as I started my independent career, I was interested in uh, biological automation and metrology, and that led me into microfluidics and into genomics. And for a while, it was building instruments there um, and then trying to use the instruments to do science. And that's kind of brought me to where I am now and kind of got me into everything from these cell atlases to uh, non-invasive diagnostics. Well, speaking of non-invasive diagnostics, um, you've had a big impact in being able to diagnose uh, the major fetal chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, I thought maybe you could tell us a bit about that and then to your latest uh, work on being able to anticipate uh, uh, preeclampsia. Yeah, that's been a long journey. Um, and I, one of these things where, you know, so much of science is personal. I suppose medicine is the same way, um, you know, and it's sort of get interested in things through your lived experience. And when I became a parent, uh, we went through the whole invasive amniocentesis thing with our first child, and it was like horrifying. And I was left with this question, why are we risking the life of our unborn baby to, to ask a diagnostic question? That didn't seem right. And that was rattling around in my head for quite some time. And I eventually stumbled across this literature on cell-free DNA. Um, every tissue in your body, when it dies, contributes DNA in your blood. And it turns out when you're pregnant, um, some, of the tissue, some of the DNA comes from the baby. And um, that had been known since the late 90s, and uh, people have been trying for a long time to use it as a way to uh, learn something about fetal genetics without success. Um, and I realized coming into it um, from a different direction that there was a very straightforward way to solve the problem. And it was very much inspired by the work we had done in single molecule biophysics, where a lot of those measurements are about counting molecules. And so I had in the head this notion that counting molecules is the way you think about things. And to make a long story short, we realized we could use these next generation sequencers to count molecules. And there was a very simple, elegant physics approach to uh, identify the genetics of the baby without having to purify the, ba the baby's DNA separately from the moms. Well, yeah, that was a set off a revolution in prenatal diagnosis. And it seems like you're about to do that again, being able to anticipate eclampsia. Um, there's been papers in both science and nature in recent weeks uh, and it seems like you've got another chapter in, in, among many uh, in that. Yeah, that was a long time coming. That was a, like a, almost a whole decade of effort once we had finished with the genetics part. I mean, because preeclampsia, preterm birth, that's about phenotype, not about genetics necessarily. And so we switched from DNA to RNA and circulating cell-free RNA had also been discovered a long time ago, but had kind of not been investigated as carefully as DNA. And so we, we picked that up some years ago and wanted to use that as a measure of phenotype of mom and baby and say, you know, what the, what's the signal message coming out about how things are going? Um, and yeah, there were false starts along the way, um, but we finally got it done and feeling really good about it, that uh, this is gonna be a very general approach to monitor maternal and fetal health. Yeah, especially since there's ways to intervene and prevent that from happening. Now, another thing that I found really intriguing, and I wonder what your thoughts were when you started with the prenatal diagnosis, and then 
these samples were coming back from mothers at 12 weeks or so and picking up cancer, uh, cancer from their, I, this was unanticipated. And now there's these various companies that are trying to get into the whole idea of being able to diagnose cancer at the earliest possible time through a tube of blood. Where do you think that's going? Yeah, I'm optimistic about that. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you look at kind of the, the current state-of-the-art tests that are used, um, you know, PSA screening for men, mammograms for women, the performance is really not that great. Um, and so there's plenty of room to improve on that. And uh, I, I do accept this argument that the earlier you detect cancer, the better the outcomes are because you can treat it surgically. And so I, I think there's a sort of fundamental logic there that's sound. Um, and, you know, as with anything, you know, there, there's a bit of a... a PR curve and fluff and things like that in the air. So you can't believe everything you read in the marketing material from, from these companies. But fundamentally, I think the field is going in the right direction and it's going to provide something useful for human health over time. Yeah. And just yesterday, there was a paper in Nature that uh, showed how you these mutations, these driver mutations are appearing decades before cancer mm -hmm. is manifest and even examples of in utero mutation. So, I mean, if you knew about them way ahead of time and had surveillance someday, maybe could really help um, preventing uh, actual cancer. So it's exciting. And now this is like, you're, you're into so many of these things and here you were, you were very successful uh, in the uh, program at Stanford. And then uh, Chan Zuckerberg said, well, we're going to start this bio hub and we want you and Joe DeRisi at, at UCSF to head that up back, what, five, six years ago? Mm -hmm. And so you've been splitting your time in these two worlds. Is that right? I have. It's been a, a wonderful opportunity to sort of give back to the scientific community. Um, you know, sort of coming up in my career, I, I had senior mentors who looked out for me and, you know, did really nice things along the way or no benefit to themselves. And you want to have a chance to give back, I think, and keep the cycle going. And this was a great opportunity um, in that Mark and Priscilla uh, had decided that they wanted to make um, uh, a big effort in science philanthropy and, and, uh, and to start an institute in the Bay Area, which we call the Biohub at the end of the day. And we managed to pull together Stanford, UCSF and Berkeley and, um, and kind of try to do something bigger than any one of us um, and something bigger than would be done in any university in terms of the projects we were taking on. Um, and, you know, we managed to pull it together. We've supported 100 faculty um, to work on the riskiest, most exciting ideas. We just announced the second cohort of another 80 odd. Um, so we're pushing 200 now. And um, it's really done amazing things for the scientific and intellectual ecosystem in the Bay Area. Um, and uh, uh, it's been just a joy to be a part of it. Um, been a heavy lift, but um, it's been an awesome experience. Is the reason why it's successful, besides that there's this funding resource, is because it's not like the NIH where you basically have to have some lo uh, low risk project and have the data done already. Uh, how, what is the what is the secret sauce here? Yeah, well, it's very complementary. I mean, I think philanthropy and public funding work together hand in hand. There's nothing that replaces the NIH at all. I mean, it's just so essential and important, and you know has such a huge footprint on science, but. You know, given that it is public money being used there, I think people are appropriately cautious with how it's spent. And it's, you know, it, it's, it's hard to do really risky things that, you know, many of which might fail. And that's where philanthropy tends to step in, that even though the dollars are smaller, you can fund those risky things. And philanthropists often, you know, uh, self-made ones have, you know, taken on huge risks and they have comfort with that. And that carries through with how they approach uh, their other activities in their lives. And so this definitely, we had a mandate to go out and do really risky stuff. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of the things we've seen that have gone on to receive federal funding and, you know, have, have you know, get into the system. And, and I think that's kind of the symbiotic relationship between philanthropy and public funding. So these faculty at uh, Berkeley, UCSF and Stanford, they can apply and it gets reviewed by, a, you know, a science panel. Now, do they have to actually have some pilot data about their hot idea or no 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 not at all it's a sort of a fun the person process you know <laughs> we want your most exciting idea we want to know that you had a good strong track record in science and uh that's how you're graded and it's hundreds of millions of dollars right it's it's the first five years was roughly 100 million and we have yeah. another 100 million in the second yeah. five years wow yeah. phenomenal now 
you're also branching out to fund more hubs outside of the Bay Area. Is that right? That's right. So last October, we celebrated the fifth birthday of the BioHub, and we kind of took a few moments of reflection and organized a seminar and uh, and an event. Had a lot of really fun speakers come in, um, both from outside the BioHub and from our internal groups. And um, and you know, I think Mark and Priscilla also sort of viewed that as a as a big anniversary, and they were thinking about science philanthropy. And by December, they had announced a re-upping of their commitment to science philanthropy, sort of across the board. They extended the BioHub. Uh, they announced the New Imaging Institute. They announced the Kempner Institute at Harvard, uh, and they announced the, uh, that they were going to set up a network of BioHubs and and asked me to help grow the organization from a regional one to a national one. Yeah, that's pretty striking. So you envision several of these BioHubs in the years ahead? Yeah, we'll grow the network to you know, four or five new ones, I think. Yeah, wow. Now, this is, I guess, an outgrowth of uh, the uh, Mark and Priscilla wanting to eradicate diseases of mankind, which is a fairly aggressive, ambitious goal. Uh, of course, they have the resources to help in that regard. Uh, how do you see it? Um, you, you're into kind of tools. You've had a, a remarkable uh, uh, science and entrepreneurial uh, track record of developing new tools that are really getting granular into understanding biology, diseases, health. Is that the, is that the ticket to our path for disease eradication? Well, I, I think their view is a very long view. And, and the key to this that makes it not ridiculous, even though it sounds a little ridiculous to say, I couldn't say it with a straight <laughs> face for a while, but, but now I sort of can. Um, is that the long time scale, they see this happening over 100 years. Um, and if you look at how, you know, mortality in the United States has changed over the last 100 years, changed by a factor of two, went down. Um, and so you can have pretty substantial changes over that time scale. Um, so it's not so ridiculous. And uh, when you have the long view, um, you can say, I'm going to invest in basic science and new technologies that are going to take decades to get in the clinic and are going to be incredibly transformative when they do. Um, and so uh, once you've decided that that's your time scale, you can say, I'm, I'm going to look at really fundamental things um, that'll be transformative, both scientifically and technologically. And that's an awful lot of fun to think about. Um, yeah, it really is. Now, what we've seen over the years from these efforts is multi-layered data, data from genome, microbiome, epigenome proteome, environment, you know, social determinants of health, of course, you know, what's in electronic records, phenome, all this stuff, right? So we can understand potentially an individual at a level that is unprecedented, and it just keeps getting more rich as we get sensors, multiple sensors with continuous data output. But we don't have a way to really analyze that data, mm -hmm. at least yet. That's what are right. your thoughts about the importance of data science as to a part of the way that we're going to get progress? Well, I mean, it's a key part of the equation for sure. And the advances in AI um, have been just astounding over the last decade. I mean, really incredible, not just on the clinical side, but also on the basic science side. I mean, uh, AlphaFold is an amazing achievement, right? And I think it's pointing the way towards uh, new ways to think about how those computational tools interact, not just in, the, in sort of human health and the clinical side, but also in basic science. And we're just barely getting our heads around it as a scientific community. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you really nailed it there. The fact that there's a way that you can take an amino acid sequence and predict the, the uh, tertiary structure of any protein as we're headed there because of alpha fold. And that is just a precursor of many things we'll see throughout life science and medicine. Uh, it's actually pretty remarkable what you've been able to accomplish in your still young career. Uh, I think one of the other things that uh, a lot of people will be interested in, because you've intersected these different fields uh, of physics, uh, life brought it to life science in many respects, medicine, uh, being able to build new startup companies, uh, is what is your advice to most of the Medscape audience are health professionals. Uh, uh, how do they try to do this kind of stuff? What, what, what is the way forward? Many of them would like to be active, uh, have great ideas, um, but they really don't have a, a path forward. Do you, you have any sense of what you could advise them? Yeah, um, that's a good question. So uh, 
you know, I think staying engaged in the scientific literature is, is super helpful because you're kind of following the thread there. I think doctors are in a unique position um, to change the course of science um, because they're on the front line seeing what's happening in their patients and in their practices. And that doesn't always filter back so straightforwardly. I mean, there's always been kind of this priesthood of biologists who said, these are the important problems in biology because we're looking at medicine and we think this is it. But you know, those translations, I think, have never been perfect fidelity, and they've been selective in some ways. And, you know, like, I fell into the whole non-invasive prenatal testing through an interaction with a clinician. Um, and, you know, we made all that happen. Um, and that was not on the radar. I mean, cell-free DNA was an obscure little corner of, 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 of research at that point. And um, now it's become, you know, something very large. And so, um, you know, those clinical insights can be super valuable and they can change the course of science and research. Um, so being alert for that and, you know, it, it's a privileged position for physicians. Um, I also think there's structured ways to get involved in translating things. At Stanford, we have a program called Biodesign, um, which has been super popular. Um, many physicians are taking that and learning how to, uh, how to translate their ideas into technologies and, um, uh, and, and in the companies. And there's many such programs that have been set up. Um, and, and those I think are quite helpful. Yeah, there's two things to emphasize that I think are important from what I've seen with your efforts. One is you don't have any hesitation to work with clinicians, that you understand that that's what the complementary role, that what, what's in your uh, mind and ideas uh, and how it can be shaped by that interaction. The second is that I'm so impressed is your remarkable perseverance. So you don't give up easy. Uh, we had the opportunity to work together uh, in a company called Molecular Stethoscope using cell-free RNA. At first, the idea was, you know, maybe it could be like a liquid brain biopsy because you could get cell-free RNA that from your classic paper in um, PNAS that could give us insights about neurodegenerative disease. But uh, here it's been many years since that idea came forward. I was ready to give up. <laughs> I said, we just, it's not going to work. But you just don't do that. You, you are, your middle name is perseverance. Can you tell us, um, is that that tenacity, that resilience, is that part of the story? Yeah, I mean, for sure. Yeah, I, I, I'm stubborn. It's true. Um, you know, miracle. I'm still married, maybe, but uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's a big part of science is that. I mean, you know, it it sometimes takes a really long time to get stuff figured out, and you got to follow the vision. And you know, I love that old vaudeville joke that you know it takes 20 years to become an overnight success. Um, <laughs> and I think it's so true. Right. And there's so many examples of that in science, um, you know, with all the look, Jim Allison, immunotherapies. Right. I mean, the PDL one, he was slaving away on that for a decade and there, it was not appreciated. It was a funny little corner. And, you know, when it finally all came to fruition, it was like everybody jumps on the bandwagon, um, not appreciating all the effort that had gone in without any attention, any glamour. Same thing with CAR-T. I think Carl June will tell you the same story. And so these things that you know, all of a sudden appear out of nowhere, they don't appear out of nowhere. Somebody was persisting for a really, really long time um, when other folks didn't believe. Yeah, that is a point that just doesn't get enough emphasis. People think that somehow the mRNA vaccines came out of the sky and, you know, 10 months, there was, there was 30 years of work uh, with Catalin Carrico and Drew Weissman and, and so many others along the way. And so, this is, I think, and you cannot just be brilliant and uh, come up with great ideas, but you have to be exceptionally patient. Uh, and, uh, you know, that is something I think that decades often is what it takes yep. for these brilliant ideas to get transformed into changing medicine. Well, Steve, it's wonderful to have the chance to have a, a conversation with you. Um, you're an inspiration. You always have been for me ever since um, that first time when your genome was presented at one of our Future of Genomic Medicine conferences. I, I think you were the first person I know who had their genome sequenced and published in The Lancet, no less. Uh, so your pining efforts, um, I think, help so many others to realize what can be done with really great ideas. Uh, nice that the CZ Biohub is getting behind a lot of other people, young people, to harness their potential uh, to be uh, able to 
uh, affect the future of medicine. I don't know if we'll eradicate all the common diseases. Uh, we probably won't be around when that happens someday, perhaps, but uh, it, it takes a, a lot of um, big ideas, a lot of patience, a lot of transdisciplinary cooperation uh, to Indeed. get this stuff done, right? Indeed. And, you know, if we don't try, it's definitely not going to happen. So <laughs> we're going to try. Well, keep up the great stuff. And uh, I know a lot of people will be inspired by this discussion and what you've been doing to shake up uh, medicine over many years. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Eric. It's been great to chat. 